um hello everyone nice to e meet you uh, mm -hmm. um yeah so um my name is niklas i'm working with my clan nearly for eight years now i think i forgot the time it feels longer but something like that and um i joined them um when the winery was already on a switch you know as i hope you know or heard already we are not just winery it's a farm it's a biodynamic farm and farming is the main focus we have so the winemaking was never priority and i think it still isn't which is a good thing in my opinion you know it's first and foremost um, farming and the farm so we care about the grapes and the quality of that and then we i guess with the low intervention style of winemaking you get automatically a pretty good wine but um, when I joined them, it was a little bit on a switch from going in a more deeper direction when it came to wine. So I helped them with that in the beginning. Um, I'm not technically a trained winemaker, but I worked as a sommelier and worked in different wineries and worked also in the wine buying segment. So I was in all different stuff in the wine industry and joined them um, yeah, out of passion to work with a more sustainable, organic, biodynamic uh, driven farm. And in the beginning, I took care a lot about the communication, how, you know, we received out there. I've realized that there's a lot of issues or people, you know, we were more in this classical organic world, you know, at home. And there was not the right market for our wines. I felt there was so much potential and the wines were too good for that, but maybe a little bit too little interesting or not good communicated for the real I wine trade or the natural wine scene, which was growing mm -hmm. in that time. So I, I done that in the beginning a lot, but then clearly quickly uh, grew close with Werner and Angela who established a wine part of the farm. And we kind of built it up together and became a trio and like partners in the winery. So Werner uh, is um, the oldest son of the family and established a wine part of the farm and with his later wife, Angela, they both started it together. They met in university. They both studied winemakers or enologists and um, Works a little call, but now um, So yeah, um, and so there was a little bit the mission in the beginning, and then you know it turned more into running the property or the wine part together, and I'm helping them with everything, uh, you know. And nowadays we kind of became like one little family in the family itself. Um, and, and running the winery together. So I'm part of winemaking. I'm part of this lot. Is, I do also normally a lot of travels and representing also the winery out there. Most people, when they see my clan somewhere or know about it, it's through me or I'm the first contact, you know, because they, you know, being so, Werner is such the farmer and also the um, more technical person who runs the everyday ex executive in, in the cellar and the pumping and the bottling and the labeling and all that. And then Angela is more a little bit of cellar master who tastes most of the wines and makes a pre-blending. And then it comes to the stage where we three decide together how the final wine really looks like. Plus she has four children and runs a Waldorf school. So she's also a bit occupied with that family part. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, that's how I joined it. So um, also the other thing that I thought might be helpful at the beginning to talk about is a little bit of, um, about um, the tiers of wine that you make at Meinklang, because I, um, for me, like just from the outside, it feels like there's like the Bergenland white and red as a kind of one group, and then maybe Mulachuk is kind of another kind of label, and then there's like the Nacht and Aben series, yeah. and then some Graupart. I mean, there's a lot of different pieces, but do you think you could maybe help people kind of understand generally, um, like these different categories of wines you make? I love Trini for her clear questions. It's so professional. Normally I have to talk always and there's nothing coming from people, but I knew with you it would be an easy one. Uh, yeah, so um, it's, you know, something like that is obviously growing organically, right? Like everything and same like your book or portfolio, maybe as an importer or maybe you guys, I don't know if you work in restaurants, some of you have wine lists or wine shops. It, that also maybe you never planned to have Eastern European wine and then you fell in love with it and all by a sudden you have a quite big selection of it. And that's a little bit for a winery. I think if you stay open, same. You know, we don't like the idea of having two fixed opinions about wine making. 
I think this is the greatest asset we have at Mein Klang. Again, that we have more this farmer approach and not this like classical, that vineyard has to taste like that. That has to be like that. That's my premium cuvee, whatever. And this is my village wine and all this. I think this is, I mean, I understand. I, again, studied some years as well and understand the background of it, but I think it harms more the wine world and, and pushes down freedom a lot in the wine industry. I think when, when I... Uh, travel in other countries like, I don't know, Australia, South Africa, America. Um, I find the wine industry much more, the natural wine industry much more diverse and interesting because they don't have these rules and, you know, they do whatever they think feels good and feels right and makes a good result. And sure, there's traditions part of Europe, but they were also mostly built at the, the modern traditions in the uh, techni technicized wine world, you know. Um, so that's as a, as a um, you know, starter of that, that I think that always grows a little bit organically and we are always open to new things. So sometimes something unplanned happens. So we didn't have this like classical, maybe, you know, a lot of wineries you see in Germany, they go to a marketing agency, they make them their whole labels, their whole design, everything, you know, and they're, how they should marketing their different lines and quiz. And I think that's a little bit... Um, you know, unfree and, and unindividual. We like to keep it for ourselves. So it seems maybe in the first place a bit messy, but um, we used to have even more cuvées. When I came, I cut down a lot and we had much less wines. We had actually at one point quite little wines and all the wines had the similar label when we came with the cutout cow and all this audit cow, which is like foiled, you know, was just those two labels and nothing else. And then we started to create more diversity. Our wines were getting better, I think. We had much more interesting stuff in the cellar. So that was all kind of the basic line. And then our, or, the, or the general line also there from entrance to, to more upscale wines. But yeah, we had more project wines going on. So maybe as a recap, what we're doing also the Burgenland White and Burgenland Red, for example, are the a little bit like a house wine, you know, you can use them always. They're no brainers. You can bring them even to granny's 80s birthday and everyone is happy. Um, though it also is interesting enough for a person who likes wine and is maybe into organic biodynamic wine. It's honest made wines. They're made the same way like all the other wines. The only difference is they are a little bit younger and therefore slightly filtered, just gentle paper filtered that they can get on the market that early and that they are stable and that again, you know, wines which are more free and have maybe no or low sulfites or being not filtered means that they also develop, you know, with time and surrounding and everything and storage. So if you bring it to a party where you want to be sure because it's your boss you know, invited you and then you bring a maybe natural wine that doesn't show good on that particular day is not great. And that person thinks, ah, it's shitty organic wine. And this is what we wanted to take out a little bit of the market, you know, to be like, you can make also really stable, clean natural wine, but obviously it maybe misses a little bit of liveliness. Like I drink those wines when I, again, have my parents over who are not into natty wine, you know, um, <clears throat> or on a summer barbecue party where it doesn't really matter, but you still want a really clean, fun wine. Or by the glass in restaurants where you need also a fair price entrance stuff, which you can convince people to, to try maybe a, spontaneously forget the fermented organic wine that's for many people right the first time they hear that and they maybe have a little bit a distance to it. it's like when you said five years ago to people oh it's a veggie burger they're like oh my god that will taste horrible you know and that's the same what i, I think was a lot with organic wine or natural fermented wine so that's a bullman red and white they are really for us for me the stable of the of the of the farm you know they are like the in, in a way a little bit the most important stuff um, because um, they, they, they are like the entrance, the door opener, the bridge builder is maybe a good word for, for many people to those wines, but also to the Mein Klang range. Yeah. And then the Muller Jack, the Muller Jack red and white is kind of the next step from those wines because we realized also over the years, all of our other wines are cloudy, unfiltered, more free, maybe more soulful. And we realize the world is also getting more in that direction. Now you can sell even natural wine in, I don't know, Wisconsin and Arkansas and places where I would never have even thought that people would drink those wines. That means there's many places like 
you have like California, like New York, where people drink nothing else than those wines, you know? So we were like, I think we felt the world is a bit more ready for entrance style, funkier, um, more natural approach. And that's how the Muller Chuck started. So we wanted a white, which is skin fermented because we do a lot of skin fermentation and that's already since 15 years. I think it fits perfectly to our terroir. It has this like, you know, we have all these aromatic fruity varieties here and the skin fermentation uplifts that even, but brings also a bit of structure, which we sometimes missing a little bit because acidities are rather low because it's quite warm climate and pH is, is pretty high. So um, we wanted it to be a fresh uh, drinky, wait a second, um, a fresh, useful um, skin fermented wine, which is um, feasible. That's always also my clung philosophy, as you know, you know, like to have feasible wines, which are approachable and, and not just for an elite or something. Um, we, want, we want to invite people with wines and, and not exclude them which I think is a bit an issue of the natural wine world for me more and more, you know, that, that it becomes so elitaire, you know, and just for the upper class. Um, and the Muller Chuck Red, again, same, same idea, more easy drinking, you know, and really fresh, really cloudy, really funky, really spicy um, kind of red wine. And then we have the single variety wines, which is Blau Frankish Pinot and the Gruner. They are kind of, um, we used to have more and we cut them down more and more. I, maybe one day they will not exist anymore. And they're like kind of in between, you know, they're natural and fun um, and solid, but also work good with wine. They're like kind of really diverse wines. Um, I think especially on the reds, they're really interesting. Also the Grüner is fun, but it's also a little bit more, uh, you know, um, easy or, or for the people who are just starting with natural wines. And then um, the Graupert line was founded already 12, 13 years ago. That's basically wines which are unpruned. The Graupert in the word stands for that. It means wild or unkempt. Those two particular vineyards are unpruned. So therefore they create smaller, very thicker skin, more aromatic concentration and really unique style of wine. Mm -hmm. um, so we, that's maybe the only two wines where we gave it single vineyard names, which we normally not do at the farm because it's not the culture yet. And we kind of like to blend also the diversity. Everything's kind of blended what we do besides, for example, those two wines. Then we have the Vulcan and the Foam Vulcan. They are kind of unique and also therefore different of the label because they um, are grown in Hungary at uh, Shomlo Hill, which is an hour south from us. We are Hungarian Austrian farm and we always wanted to show also uh, at least one wine in our portfolio from Hungary. But after the border where we are based, there's no vineyards because the land is a bit lower and more, more fertile. It's good for farming, not good for winemaking. So we found 2006, this beautiful place at Shomlo, which has a big heritage and really high reputation actually in, the, in Hungary, but also in the classical wine world. It used to be really a famous place. And there we make one cuvee, like one, or one pre-picking for the Petnat, the foam Vulcan, and then one really ripe, really selected, really complex style, which called Vulcan. And um, then the daytime wines, which is the morning, day, evening, and night is something which just, as you know, Trini started in 2017. It was kind of my first own project at the farm. So the mine clung has been faded in the background in the label. And it's a friend of mine, one of my best friends. He's a uh, artist from Copenhagen and a Somi. We were in a music festival together and started that idea. He makes the label, I make the wine, and it should be something really different and really different to mine clung, but with mine clung fruit. And then Werner and Angela loved that first vintage and first vintage we just had Nacht, which was the Pinot Noir one wine. Um, they loved it so much that we made it into a fixed part of the Meinklang thing and made four wines out of it. So you have morning, day, evening, and night. They are like one daytime and they are all kind of limited editions. So we now also went away from calling them by vintages. We're calling them now by editions. So edition one, two, three, and it will be every year something different. Those wines is total freedom, really limited. We can play as we want, we choose every year four particular um, parcels, which we believe stand out the most and make something really uh, unique and, and individual, which we never maybe done before. You know, sometimes it can be the same vineyard from the year before, sometimes it can be really different. It's like a little bit against the trend that everything, you know, kind of has to taste every year the same. Um, which we realized as well, even for our natural wines, you know, people always compare the new vintage with the vintage before and on those wines, we get a little bit away from that. Um, I think that's all. And then obviously we have the pet nuts, which are 
standing a little bit out, which have the foam name, the foam Vulcan, the foam white, the foam red. And then you have Prosa. Um, yeah, Prosa is also standing a little bit alone. It's like a lonely one. Mm -hmm. um, but this is also like kind of, it fits for me to the Burgner white, red and Prosa. They kind of belong together. Also this like cuvées, different varieties, really this mild climate expressing all those three wines for me are really mild and fun and fruity and just, you know, feeling good. They're, they're few good wines for me. And, and Prosa was the first wine ever uh, made at the winery. It was Werner St. Angela's wedding wine. And they liked it so much. They're like, okay, let's do it. And now it's our most successful wine over the last 10 years already. So for you guys, like um, in terms of farming, you're certified Demeter, right? Uh -huh. um, and so uh, like, how does it work for the scale? Because I think that, you know, for most people, they associate natural wine as being like a small production. And, you know, I've, I've noticed recently, sometimes people make these um, remarks about how some, if a wine is too affordable, it's, it somehow can't be natural or, you know, not made with integrity. And is that something that you guys feel vulnerable to these kind of comments or ideas about yeah. your scale of farming? Yeah, 100%. One, one I mean, Right, I mean, th that, that would be now something which spans over many things where we could talk really long about it. And I think it's a, it's a worthy discussion we need in the wine industry, especially in the natural wine industry. I think we're living in a too romanticized world. The wine world was always like that. The natural wine world also is going in that, or is like that a lot. It's a lot of storytelling, you know, and it's this, we're coming to that point where I feel this individually hippie tomb, you know, like this one person who does this something really crafty and artsy. That's the game changer. That's the person you're interested And that's beautiful. You know, that's great. I know many, many of my friends are like that and working like that. But we also have to accept the fact that that will not change the world. We will not feed the world with just really like $10 apples, you know, which are super crafted from one crazy dude who makes that and like touch that the apple. I don't know. Um, and sometimes it, it, oh, sometimes it always bothers us that we have to have this discussion in the industry, but it's an, it's an important discussion because people forget where biodynamics even come from. Biodynamics not started from small individual farms to be even more individual and even more special. It wasn't including idea of farming when Buddha Steiner who's not the founder but created ideas maybe around basically just put it on a paper which was always there with some more modern influences and some tools for the modern farmer or the more industrial world of farming or the industrial world in general um, was giving on hand and it was huge huge farms back then who requested Steiner to come to their farm he lived there two years and then made the, the conclusions out of it back then it was normal and natural that every small really small farmer works in balance nowadays to be a small farm is already kind of a status you reach which is for me a nonsense you can do really shitty farming as a small farmer same as you can make really shitty farmer as a, a farming as a big farmer you can do fantastic great farming as a big farmer and as a small farmer. It's all about yourself. The problem we have is the conclusion people make that because it's big, it's like Coca-Cola and because of it's big, you use Monsanto seeds and because it's big, you use glyphosate and because you're big, your only interest is money. But this is a really um, wrong idea. You know, it's an information people receive from the classic, classical capitalist industrial world but that doesn't mean it for everything. Patagonia is for me a great example as a company, for example, which I use a lot as an example. They can they do a large scale, um, successful clothing brand, but do it more sustainable than most small brands could do it because they have the power. They have a standing in politics. They change really things. They change laws. They, they protect national parks. You know, they go out there with their people, their money, their marketing, and actually make a change. Why they can do it? Because they have thousands of employees billions of, 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 of um, profit every year, and they put it in the right resources. They don't do it because they want to get richer and richer, and their CEO wants even more payouts. They do it because for the right cost. And that's how you can use bigger scale farming companies, whatever, to really make an actual change. Because to have that idea that everyone is, that we just look on small farming as something prestige and natural, as you say, and then crafty, 
well, then it will stay the 1% and for an elite. Well, then we all go down in glory, you know, but in 200 years, we can still sip our $100 natural wine and feeling so grateful about that there's a handful of people doing that in the world, but the world will not exist at one point anymore. That, that will not make a change because people have to understand that to come to that point that we can feed the world like that, it would be possible, don't get me wrong, but that will mean 50% of humanity has to be farmers again. And I doubt that that will happen. If that happens, then, then you know, we share our farm. <laughs> People are welcome to join. But you need the responsibility. And that's what I, I guess is missing in society a lot, you know. And to come to explain why Meinklang has a size, it's purely by the responsibility we took because more and more people stopped working around us. Lots of organic land was free. And we always just accumulated it and it came in our hands. And we're like, okay, we can do it better. We can farm it biodynamic. And also with a certain size, when we, where 2001 joining Biodynamic, they made a certification. We had already a decent size and they forced us to have this real holistic idea of farming, which you couldn't do when you're smaller. I never been to a small winery, which actually, or there's some examples, maybe like Hayu and some people I know, but um, there's barely small wineries existing who have their own animals because the legal restrictions are so tough. But as a bigger farm, you have more people, more resources, more money you can maybe put into it or just more capital, you know, you can put into it, you know? And um, I think this is something so people forget a little bit the holisticness about it. And that's, I think, an issue in general in modern society. It's easy to hear, yeah, I've been to so many wine fairs and people are like, yeah, you know, we're so small, we're so crafty. I'm like, that is already a, 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 a quality you, you acquired, you know, you're proud on that, that you're small. I don't understand that, you know, I have to say. And um, I think it becomes from there, this capitalist world, you know, as I said before, because all big brands are necessarily not doing it for a good cause, but for the money. But you can also do it as a small, why there's many wineries in the natural wine scene, which are making prices, which are maybe not humble. You know, it's about humbleness and you can be, same humble as a big farm as a small farm but same on both sides you can be as unhumble you know um so I, I think it's the wrong question people ask you have to look just much more individual on the on each individual case and um yeah i think sometimes it's sad that people you know don't don't look deep enough into it you know we always still, even in that scene want to hear this romantic stories because we all like stories we like the world out there to imagine it more romantic as it is but that's not the case you know we are on the edge and especially when it comes to farming on a super crazy edge um to fall down you know and 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 the idea of biodynamic farming in particular and the same fukuka technique when he started the permaculture was always to feed the world you know and we will not you know feed the world by a few small farms we we need also farms which leading you know also then you have a political voice we always say that with like and we are in the organic world not big you know like still we are small there's huge farms who have also a power out there as i said as an example before with patagonia you have also political power you know you have a lobby and you need that nowadays unfortunately we don't live in this world and i think sometimes people think we will go to we don't you know we don't live in a world I live here since eight years, didn't saw any small farms popping up, you know, wineries, yes, because people love wine and it's a, it's a, it's kind of a cool product to work with nowadays, but I didn't see cool five hectare grain farms popping up, you know, I didn't see that, you know, I, and I still don't see it. So I think we, we have to also be rational about it. So can we tie this into um, how like just because I think people kind of know you're a farm, but maybe they don't see the relationship by how the other farming activities tie into the wine. So could you just talk a little bit more generally? Cause I know you have cattle, right? So we um, are basically, I always, I started now to explain it as a cooperative, a little cooperative in itself, like mm -hmm. in the family. So you have basically four individual families who all, specialized in one part of farming and that all together creates this two and a half thousand or two thousand hectare biodynamic farm um and the only reason and we also say that because is again responsibility all the family members stayed in the farm we know that this is unique if you would start that kind and that's also what people they know just how big 
companies or firms working on a corporate level where we, you would need a lot of managers and consultants, banks, and so on and on. And that brings with you obviously the issue that you have to make lots of money or, or money is maybe the first interest because you have to please all those people behind it. And then you make compromises. We don't have that because there is not such thing existing. It started it really organic. We never had banks really involved. Sure, we made loans, you know, and loan money, but we weren't really connected to it. We never had investors. We never had partners. We never had any consultant on the farm. We really grew it in the family naturally by ourselves. Now, of course, we look for other people like I joined, you know, because you have to like go with the time as well. But then also I can tell for myself, you really have to dig in there and, and build your respect at the farm. And then you become something like a family member, you know, like Vanna's mom is for me like my second mom, you know, we, we eat everyday lunch together, we celebrate Christmas together. It's, it's a really personal experience, you know, and it's so unique there because of all the families involved. So basically we have the wine part, which is Vanna Angeli slash me. And then you have um, the farming side, which is Werner's brother, Hannes. We farm a lot of different ancient grains, einkorn, emma, spelt, old rye varieties, um, old wheat varieties. We are uh, um, creating seeds for um, ancient grains to make them available to public. That means, you know, you have seed banks, you have bad seed banks. You know, most, uh, most people don't know that, but most seeds in the world are owned by three companies, I think, in the world. One is, for example, Monsanto is one of the bigger ones. Um, or biggest ones. So anytime you buy a broccoli seed, even in a supermarket, you um, pay a little bit of money to uh, Monsanto because they own the patent on that particular broccoli. So there's an, uh, a, a, there's like nonprofit organizations existing all over the world um, who, who create or recreate these old varieties by the patents as a nonprofit organization and make them available to public forever you know they kind of make a contract with public that no one can ever make money on it um, or buy that 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 seat you know to make a pattern on it um, so this we've done a lot in the past with 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 those seed banks is like um, yeah non-profit organizations and um, we farm also corn for polenta like eating corn not not the corn the bad corn which you use for the for the animals for the mass production like like yeah, e eating corn, I don't know how you say that. Um, we do barley, we do uh, oats, we do amaranth. Um, yeah, and then it always rotates. You know, there's always different things of farming we, we have on the farm. Um, we have elderflowers, we have apples, 20 hectares, where we used to make some cider and some juice. And then the cattle the animals joined in 2001 too and that's the other brother of Werner Lucas who's in charge uh, for them and that started out of the biodynamic idea to be really self-sufficient and have a holistic uh, farming approach means our own manure you know and closing the loop like for example Thomas a friend of us he joined now he's a chef and he's now you know we also making the same what we do with the wine we take the farm product and adding the value so we're starting making our own flour from the grains like artisanal handcrafted flour we bought our own stone ground uh, mill and Thomas is doing that and then for example all the husk you know and the stuff you have left from the milling we give them as animal uh, as food to the to the porks you know um to the pox to the pigs yeah, yeah. um pox is already the meat right yeah uh, i always forget that um we don't have two words for it like you you guys have two words for it right when it's already on the plate and as a living animal we don't uh anyways um so you know it's it's one loop and the animals now we have as i said um pigs an old breed called mangalitsa uh, we have two breeds of cows, which is Angus and Obrak. Um, and then we have some uh, sheep. Um, and they are also an old variety from Austria called Kreiner Steinschaf. And then we have chickens and I think 10 horses. So it's pretty diverse. And then the parents of Werner, Hannes and Lukas, they're still fully in charge also of the farming together with Hannes. Anneliese, the mom of Werner, she's one of the most respected organic farmers in the grain world because she was the, one of the first in 82 or something that turned the whole farm organic and, and had really availability and were the first working with ancient grains as well. So 
it's not just something, you know, it's not just farming and being big or something. It's everything of that has an, has an idea then in itself as well. You know, and as I said, we are specialized in each individual subject and that all together brings them the diversity. You could create that also with five farmer friends. You're a winer maker. Maybe the other one is good with animals. The other one good with grains. The other one is good with vegetables. And you all buy a big land together and create your, it's like a little commune then, you know, like you, everyone could do that. It's not that complicated. And you have much more power because you're bigger and you have this diversity and everyone can work together. Another thing we talk a lot about and which became a recent discussion in the natural wine scene, the labor issue, you know, which is a huge issue in the world, how we, still have labor in the world you know and it is a sad story there's no no goodness of it you know because um in america you have people from mexico in uh, europe you have people from eastern europe you know or northern africa that's how it is and it's not a good thing so our approach on that is um we as a bigger farm as a holistic farm with many things can employ people the whole year we have so much full employed people wineries at our size wouldn't have that they would have a third so we have harvest we can bring a lot of those people over to harvest so we need less labor and not meaning we have no labor we need it too but we can have much less you know and then they lead also the teams you know so it's 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 more personal you have more relation to your workers you know which is a huge issue in farming that mostly it's uh, seasonal you know uh, even more in, in other things than winemaking like in in, in, I don't know, if you pick a spargus or something, that's worse, you know, if, if you would dig up the scandals which are happening there, the wine world is like a paradise, you know. Right. So I think this is also, you have a more social responsibility as a, as a more holistic farm and bigger farm as well, because you just have more people involved and you get a relation to them. From our farm, 30 families are living all year round, you know. Um, I want to open the conversation to other people to ask questions, but before yep. we do that, I want to go a little bit on a tangent. And can you tell us a little bit about your own project about importing wines into Austria and what you're doing there? Because I think that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So obviously, as Trini knows, and some of you maybe, I kind of traveled a lot to the United States. Um, I don't know. I felt always, <laughs> I felt, I felt more natural in my behavior in America than I do in Europe. I have to say <laughs> when we ever do mind clung 2.0 in America, that will be me doing it. Um, no, but I traveled a lot the last eight years in the United States. I would say a month, a year, I'm normally in the U S and now more than ever, because my wife is American as Trini knows, she's from California. Um, we are together three years now or something. So obviously on that, I travel even more to the US. So I just met a lot of wineries. And in the beginning, you know, I was also somebody in Europe, never had any American wine. Um, I realized how much diversity and interesting people are out there and some of them pushing boundaries even more than European winemakers. We are sometimes lazy on our culture and heritage and it's easier to sell than I found American winemakers for me, often we're a bit more creative, more open, more diverse, you know, and I met great farmers, you know, and it always has a stigma to the classical wine world who needs American wine, right, or not just American, anything outside of Europe. And then um, on, in the natural wine scene, it was, it was always like, it's not organic anyways, and they all don't have their own grapes, you know, so they just buy and they're just cool winemakers in a, in a shed somewhere and making lots of money. Um, and I just experienced something else. So I, I don't know how it happened. We always, I always had it a bit in mind, you know, and, and it, as you say, it was my own project and Werner just let, let me do it. So um, I used also the possibility because we export, we have this trade company, so you can do import export with all the legal stuff, pretty easy. I was shocked how easy I can bring over to the S and no one else can't do that so easy because you would need to first start that company like that and that requires money, but we had already all this infrastructure, let's say. Um, and of course I had good contacts, you know, I knew all of those American wineries since a long time. And um, so I was like, okay, let's, uh, let's start with that. And um, that started, I would say two years ago. And then I joined by some Australian winemakers who became also friends. So we just work with wineries who are know closely, who have visited the farm I know for sure they work organic and yeah where I spend some time with I wouldn't just bring someone on board you know uh, because it's 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 a fun side project obviously you can imagine people are um, 
not always as open here when it comes to those wines. The wines are pretty expensive. That's the biggest issue comparing to European wines. Um, but I also could manage to get the prices lower with like doing bigger volumes now and going fully direct, which I didn't done before where I went through England and now I can go directly. And yeah, wine's selling great. I get now a shipment, um, I think three pallets from the United States and three from Australia, and they're not even here and they're completely sold out already. I was not uh, in Corona times, you know, so I'm, I'm really grateful for that. And the whole idea is not to sell wine because I wouldn't need that, you know, and it's not, obviously bring huge money we keep our margins really low that we can you know make them for a really fair price it's more to spread the word you know and i know a lot of american natural wine makers really want to be represented in europe because it started maybe there um the, the, this particular scene so i just try to bring them in good places you know and have them available that's, that's great. I think it's just an interesting conversation, the idea of um, how, you know, through your travels and through drinking wines in different places, it feeds back into what Meinklang is doing. And that makes it a really a global conversation, which I think is, is really an interesting idea. Um, let, let's open it up to other people who might want to have some questions for you. Luke, are you on hey, the Nicholas. call? Good morning. I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. I, I, I kind of wanted to back it up to the biodynamic conversation and uh, in terms of, I know this might be hard to, to break out, but if you were to kind of, if we were to do this exercise where we were to think about what, what, Dem what the cost of Demeter certification does to a bottle of wine retail, you know, if you're farming conventionally versus, you know, uh, farming Demeter biodynamic, what, you know, what, what would you anticipate sort of dollars per bottle retail would be that that you know increase in price just yeah. i just want to kind of get a sense for a sense yeah. for what what is it what would it take for someone you know at your size to yeah. you know to get I to know. that next level yeah. if we would be now conventional and would change into the meter what would be price wise the difference right I, I think again you know that's just an estimate like i spin around now um i think it would be easily a quarter i think I think if we would be in the same, maybe more, if we would be conventional in that size, I think, yeah, the wines could maybe be half the price, you know, but pricing in the wine industry, I think it's more interesting when you ask it for grain and farming, because you literally have a fixed price and there I would say it's 30, 40% or something. Um, but with wine, as we know, it's really individual, right? You can be Chateau Petrus and you're conventional, but still selling your wine for an enormous amount of money, you know, but you can be, I don't know, Gallo, you know, in industrialized convention wine and sell it for really, really low. You can be organic industrialized and sell it for really, really low and you can be uh, really high priced organic. So I think in the wine world, the price is more um, regulated by the brand behind it and the reputation rather than, I, I don't think, I think the costs are higher, obviously for working like that. I don't think you can necessarily get automatically more money just because you're Demeter certified. That is a big discussion also right now on the Demeter board because they are now starting to request also money from people who sell their wines. You know, it's an international issue a little bit. And Demeter really, you know, wants to like force also traders and stuff like that to become certified. And, and many people say, well, but you don't, you're not able to sell the wine a higher price just because it's Demeter. And I do agree on that. I don't think our customers yeah, I think they appreciate that we are biodynamic and they, are, they, they buy our wines because they're natural wine and the right people like you guys selling them again to the right places and they communicate the wines in the right way to their customers and people are willing to pay a good amount of money because of that. But I don't think that people turn around the body, see Demeter and be like, oh, I buy that or, or I pay more because it's Demeter. Yeah. Thanks for that. Sure. It's good to see you, by the way. Good to see you as well. Yeah, such a long time. Are you still in California right now? No, 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 no. That was a short time. That was we used that little window when uh, everything was kind of possible to go because we didn't see her family for such a long time, and none of them could come to the wedding as well. So um, we used that, but we just stayed nine days or something, and and we wanted to leave before election. Happily, everything worked out well, but we were like. If it doesn't go that way, then then we want to not be there. <laughs> uh, well, well, I'll I'll uh, open this up to uh, other other folks with questions. Yeah, hit me.
Okay, I got a question. Here. Um, so I got a. Um, <laughs> oh, oh no! Go ahead, Nicholas. Okay, I was just gonna ask. Uh, you mentioned that Australian label that you work with. What was the name of that uh, label that you work with? Um, you mean the the wineries we import from Australia? Correct. Yeah. Um, so we work with um, Tom Schubrook. He's quite small um, uh, person in, in the Barossa Valley. His family has organic farms since a long time. We work with Paris Phone. It's a new small, small winery from, from a girl uh, who just started. We work with Anton's Wines from Lucy Margot and um, who was the first working biodynamic in Australia and quite known. And the fourth one is Jauma. Uh, which is also having their own organic farm now and, and biodynamic certified and having a cherry farm as well on site. Beautiful project. Hey. Sure. Um, I guess my question is, well, first, I love, love, love your wine. Um, sure. yeah. Probably my favorite winemaker um, of the year. Um, so yeah, thank you for those. Um, so my question is, I guess, in terms of um, inspiration and the way that you produce your wines, like where do you gather your inspiration and um, what sort of new things are you thinking of for the next uh, couple mm -hmm. years or things that you want to release? Yeah. Um, inspiration is it's interesting because we are such a diverse team now that I feel like we get a lot of inspiration just by discussing a lot between each other. You know, it's just, again, I think uh, often people think that in a winery, you sit there a lot and taste a lot. And I think wineries to do that. And when you're smaller, again, we talked about that before, you maybe have also more time for that. We are always kind of on the limit in a good way, you know? So uh, we do a lot by feeling and, and, uh, natural, you know, instincts. And, and so a lot happens in the harvest, in the cellar, which we didn't plant before. So we were like, oh, that's cool. Let's just do it. And then it happens. And then it's maybe not good. <laughs> disappears again. And something else, which you didn't have on the focus, turns out really amazing. And so we do a lot of different batch wines now where we try out a lot, you know, like we do definitely more with uh, stems because we really feel all the daytime wines are fermented with stems. We really feel that that benefits our wines. It releases some certain saltiness into wine. And for me, uplift really the terroir in that area, which was for a long time, not a terroir for people. It was just sand and loam and fatty wines with lots of alcohol and hot climate so you could make this overripe and people then concentrated in the cellar of course um and and we push really for that but as i said before we have also certain freedom so we don't go too crazy about it and be like we want we taste the wine and be like oh we want to do a wine like that i think that's often a wrong approach because you should look on your own place you know you should look what you can do and how good you can be at your place and, and, and try to make the best with, with your surrounding. I think every organism, every farm is really unique and individual. And sorry, I just my wife shows the Christmas tree to someone, so I'm distracted. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, and um, and um, yeah, so I think this is, this is uh, a really individual thing. You know, we obviously get inspiration by many people you try and you get always ideas. As I said, recently, I've just visited some producers in the US where I was like, wow, that's some cool ideas. And sometimes it's some simple stuff. Like I was at Subject to Change, a winery in California. And they were, for example, for the whole bunch of stuff, which you have maybe in a glass fiber tank or something, you know, normally you would put CO2 or something in it, put foil over it, it's protected. So what they did, they basically did, done a double foil and, and pushed it down on the grapes, like really thick foil, and then filled it up with water to the top that it, you know, pushes down the air and, and really makes it kind of sealed. And I never saw that before. And I was like, oh, and I told Werner of it. And we're like, okay, next year we do that as well. That's more the inspiration you sometimes get. The results, you never know anyways, right? Um, so it's more... It's more that, you know, it's more winemaking is at the end pragmatic. So it's like something like that where I'm really pumped up by it and be like, oh, cool idea. We want to do that, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's more like that. Um, 
I think you had another question though, which I forgot. There was a second part of it. It's okay. I think you answered most of it. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. <laughs> sure, thank you. I just, you know, when I talk and then I forgot what you maybe ask as well. Yeah. Nicholas, in terms of, in terms of, uh, I know this is my second go here. Um, That's in okay. terms of winemaking, do you, uh, are you operating on, in terms of like, let's just say a, 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 a wine that's produced in a larger volume yeah. versus a wine that's produced in smaller volume is a winemaking in terms of, you know, the, the mechanics of it uh, mm -hmm. and the, the, the landscape, is it fairly similar or are you doing, you know, vastly different things for say Burgundy on white than you are for um, mm -hmm. uh, one of the varietal, you know, Pinot or something like that? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, it's a good question. Um, yes and no. In general, we try to move. So in harvest, things are pretty similar. We are not dogmatic about crazy sorting tables and, you know, sort the shit out of it or, or cut down a lot of grapes before the crazy green harvest. We like diversity and the balance. We do believe wines, grapes can have also some thought of um, default on it. And that's okay too. You know, we like when a wine gets through that character too. Uh, I think we were also way too long, way too obsessed about it. And that made prices really expensive um, of things like that. Um, so so in, in, in the harvest, in the vineyard management, no, there's not huge difference between sites. Everything gets treated with the same good respect, I would say. Um, and then also in harvest, it's pretty much same. And then we processing grapes, though, a little bit different. We have a quite good system how we can proceed grapes fast, which is for us really important. And I think this is why we can do larger scale natural wine because we move really fast and really well our grapes. So like that, we have just less risk. I, I've been at many beautiful wineries, even some we import and yeah, they, they just don't have the manpower and harvest. Things stand out in crates for days, you know, sometimes and, and, and you know, in barrels. And it's just, it's less, uh, it's maybe the German approach behind it as well. This is why I think Aust Austrian and, and German natural wines are pretty clean and, and necessarily because, or in general, because uh, you, you have a little bit more control. When we do a harvest, when you go to France, People are drunk already at 1 p.m., right? That's not, that's not the case in Austria. You know, we work till 12 and then maybe open a beer and then go to bed. You know, it's like pretty yeah. serious, you know, I would say. And that makes a huge difference. Um, but then, of course, when you ask about the size, obviously we have some wines like Rosa, Burgenland White, Burgenland Reps, and the Grüne Berliner, which are 80% of our production just for wines. And then all the other 16 wines, are sharing the 20% of the production. So yeah. obviously, you know, the, the Bullman White and Red and Prosa, they work also at a price, but they also have to work because of that. You know, we can't, you know, make them too uh, free and crazy and have, you know, we, we have to look on those wines a little bit, what's going on and manage them a little bit, but not with ingredients or, or technical stuff, just, you know, they're more precise in the making so we make them as i said quicker and they might have a slight um fil filtration and um you know sitting not as long on the lease in, in the barrel you know we, we we rack them maybe more than other wines so there's definitely a more you know like more classical approach a little bit into those wines also at that size obviously if you have a wine with 100 000 liters you know split up in three tanks you can't mess that up you know that that could mean there's no winery next year, you know? So you have to be a little bit, and that's sure the difference where I say a small, really small winery. And that's what we try to do. We have tried to have this basic um, um, bridge building natural wines, not much different than the other stuff, but as I said before, not with the same liveliness and freedom than the other wines. And the other wines are then maybe like a small winery in the winery itself. And this is why we created also the daytime wines because of that. Um, and obviously, you know, like, we also always say our approach is never to make the best wine in the world. Someone with like two hectares and, and you know, all, all the focus on one, two, three wines can do that better. And that's okay for us. We just want to make really honest handcrafted wines. And I think that makes wine often better than we think, but we don't try to, to, you know, get to, we don't try to be the best natural wine out there. That's, that's not our approach neither, you know. Hi, Nicholas. I have a question. Yeah. 
Yeah, I really love selling your wines. Uh, it's been a pleasure and found some great success. Our customers really love them. And it, it's really nice to hear the explanation on the larger scale that it, it can be done on a larger scale. Um, I have two questions. One about the two, um, the two types of cows that you have, the Aubrey and the Angus. Mm -hmm. And do you do you have a, a butcher on the uh, on the farm? And how do you dispatch? And like where where do you sell the yeah. uh, the meat? And is there you know a combination of selling both the wine and the meat and the, the grain yeah. together? Yeah, it's something what we're establishing now with the, the friend I explained before, Thomas. He's originally a chef, so he does right now a lot of the the cuttings. I wouldn't say the butchering that we do. Our animals are all in Hungary on. From, from March till late October on free pastures. We have 400 hectares, which is a thousand acres of free pastures. Um, we used to sell a lot of live animals for breeding because we have quite good, you know, breeding material, material sounds horrible, like breeding genes, you know, we have a really good gene line in there. Um, so we're quite known for, you know, having good animals because we don't use any antibiotics and neither any hormones at the animals at all, um, which is quite unique, I think. It's all small herds, so you have always a natural uh, hierarchy also in the, in the cattle, in the herd. Um, you have always a bull, so you have always also natural, I don't know how you say that, um, they can have fun still, let's say it that way. Um, so it's not, not normally in, in, in farming with animals nowadays, it would be always inoculated, you know? So there's never a bull at the herd actually. And that creates a disharmony for the animals. That would be same for us, right? If you choose to go that way, that's different. But imagine, you know, we wouldn't be allowed, you know, to create babies in a natural way. I assume that would have also a mental impact on humans. And um, that's the same on the animals. Animals even more because we can choose that, right? We could be like, I don't need it, so I don't care, you know? And, and I can, you know, get myself in peace with whatever because I can choose information that makes us difference to animals. Animals don't. They live always in their natural behavior, right? A cow will be always scared of a certain thing and another thing not, right? It lives by its natural instinct and not because be like, hmm, you know, maybe, maybe I don't need the bull. Maybe I can go my own life. You know, that, that's not what a cow is doing. You know, it's not that they don't have that ability to think about that. You know, um, they can't make their own cognitive decisions. We have the cognitive, cognitive, that's a hard word. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, um, so we starting now to sell more to local restaurants. Um, actually, we are today the I think best restaurant right now in Vienna over the whole team and they will start a lot with like half animals um, called Mats and Sohn when you're ever in Vienna it's definitely the best place in in, in Vienna like in the fine dining uh, thing um, but we're working like his local burger place which makes amazing burgers and they use now our our minced meat you know which is important too because our whole idea is to sell always just whole animals we made now a Christmas package where you can order not the the the, not the fine pieces, but I don't know how you say that in English, but like the, the back, you know, so the filly and the, and the T-bone and, and the, you know, all those special cuts. Um, you could just order them if you order also 10 kilograms of the, of the um, how you say, Shmon, um, you know, slow cooking, braising, you say braising? Yeah, the br meat for braising, like, like pot roast or something, or the cooking meat, you know, for us, it's really important. And then things like the innards and stuff, we make our own uh, patties, patties, for example, and sell them then in a glass. We open a farm shop in Vienna from May to August, which was just a pop-up farm shop um, during Corona. Um, and there we sell all our, a lot of our fresh meat. And um, we're building now maybe the most first sustainable biodynamic butcher by ourselves next to the pasture, which will hopefully be done by the end of next year. So far we slaughter together with local organic little, um, yeah, slaughtery or butcher, um, but we really want to do it by ourselves um, in the future. And then we will, you know, supply more restaurants locally as well. And we look also to open a fixed location in Vienna with a farm shop and little wine bar so uh, you asked before, I remember what for other projects we have, and that's the projects we have right now. <laughs> to open a shop in Vienna, doing a wine bar, showing people this, you know, you guys, what you in the US have much more is this like interesting concepts to invite people to 
cool products, natural wine. You have that so much more. We're missing it. We don't have even one really good natural wine by Indiana, to be honest. So um, yeah, there's definitely lots of potential to get people. Europeans always think they know everything, you know, and that's a problem, especially with wine. Um, and that, that harms it a lot. So that's our future focus. We have that festival. I don't know if you heard of it. I know Luke and stuff, they knew about it, um, which we obviously had to cancel, sadly. Uh, which is another of my projects uh, with a friend of mine who's a music booker. He's a music booker since 30, 40 years. So we actually wanted to make a real proper festival with like 20, 25 bands, also from all over the world. A lot of alternative acts and, and folk music and stuff like that um, to show people the biodynamic idea, you know, that they can live it on on a, on a festival and experience it. So our, our most aim right now is how to educate people. A lot. Do you think you're gonna, um, you'll have the festival in 2021? No, we decided already to go to 2022 just because it seems so complicated. You know, we are first time festival and you can imagine to make a festival all own finance without big bang, banks and Coca-Cola and McDonald's that sponsors behind it, which literally every festival has mm -hmm. and make it fully sustainable is a crazy operation. And when I started it, I thought, oh, well, let's make that cool festival that's amazing and then i was like why we ever thought about that <laughs> but um i guess that's all good operations start like that i'm sure you, we all know how that feels but um yeah we we want to have a bit the piece of of maybe next year will be crazy i also do believe you know i normally travel a lot with the wines in a normal year i can say oh this first half year i kind of not go anywhere but i think uh, maybe let's say april may we go a bit back to normal life i'm sure there will be a lot of things happening and i have to go also out a little bit because i didn't done that for such a long time and then we opened the farm shop or planned in may so it would be all just before the festival and you have such a short time to organize it you know with such an uncertainty anyways which makes you unbalanced a little bit about it so we we rather go with a peacefulness into 2022 and, and f have a full year where we can plan, you know, with all the experience we accumulated already. So if you have, if you have any good band recommendations, you can always send them along to me. I, I would, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. <laughs> your, your friend, what, what is his name? Uh... Uh, his name is Miro Lanik. I, I don't think you know him. He uh, is a booker in Slovakia. So we are directly also on the Slovakian border. The festival will be actually happening in Hungary on one of our Hungarian lands. Um, but yeah, he was Booker in Slovakia and Eastern Europe for 30 years, part of many festivals. There's Poda, which is quite known festival, alternative, like 15,000 um, attendants. Um, he was a while Booker there as well. And, and yeah, we're really good friends. He's also a natural wine importer. He imports natural wine to Slovakia. This is how we became friends. and. Yeah, we were surprised how many bands and musicians, like known musicians, not like superstars, obviously, but like known in the alternative scene, were interested coming to a festival which they never heard of because they really appreciated the organic fact. You know, you have these writers, you know, which you get from musicians. Um, I don't know if any one of you ever worked with me, where you get, you know, these writers, technical writer, what they need on stage, blah, blah, blah. And you have always a catering writer as well. And like, it used to be that I won 10 bottles of Jack Daniels and whatever. And now when you see those writers, it's all like vegan food, organic and natural wine. I literally saw many of those writers on natural wine. I'm like, no problem. Come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's funny. That changed too a lot, you know, and that's, I think it fits, you know, this music scene now. And, you know, there's a lot of um, meeting points. That's, yeah. That's awesome. It'll definitely put it on our calendar for 2022. We want to yeah. come. Good. Yeah. I also, if you, if I may have, I have another question about Lake Needlestill and uh, its role in the where your vineyards, where certain varieties are planted, and you mentioned that um, when you use the stems of some wines, you have some saltiness. But can you can you speak to the lake and its role? Oh, in the yeah. product? forgot totally to mention that i mean we didn't talk really about area but yeah so um we are just on the east shore of um of a big lake it's the biggest lake in austria called the new settler lake or neusiedler see in german and uh, this is kind of the remaining part of an ancient ocean called the pannonian sea which was 
you know, covering most of Europe, going all the way to Istria down and kind of meet there with the, with the, um, with the Atlantic slash, um, um, how you say that, Middle Sea? I don't know, I even say that in English. Um, Mediterranean Sea, that's how you call it. Um, and yeah, so the, the new settler lake is kind of the remaining part of it. It's kind of like a bathtub where you put the plug and you still have a little bit of water at the end in the bathtub, you know, and it is standing there. That's a new settler lake. And the, the part where we are, so the other side, you know, the Alps were formed and that pushed away that whole ocean, that ancient, ancient ocean. Um, and so the other side of the lake is the end of the Alps. So you see, have a little mountain range, not high, I think in feet, it's something like, I don't know, I'm bad in feet. Three feet are in a meter. So it's like 1,500 feet. So it's not really, um, really high. Um, or even a little bit less, 1,200 feet. And then you have the lake and then comes the flat Pannonian uh, land. And this used to be a swamp and the whole area and was then drained by man-made canals in the 16th century to make it available as a farm land. Um, and so over the hundreds of years, it became more dry, especially close to the lake. The lake is disappearing more. So that land, close to the land, became more sandy, rocky, kind of like poor. You know, we say in German, you can use that. I know in English not. I don't know if you have a better word, but you normally say in German, you get good wine from poor soil. You know, you don't want rich, fertile, humus rich soil. That's good for farming and vegetables and grain, but not good, not good for wine. Um, so that became a wine area um, maybe a hundred years ago or something like that. And that's all close to the lake. So when you look where the wines are, they're all close to the lake. And you still have this like muddy ground, you know, this like com compromised loam. And there's a lot of little salt lakes in the area rem remaining from that ancient time. And even like salt herbs, which are really rare, which you can eat, you know, they're protected. It's, it's all a national park, the whole area now. Um, it's the oldest national park in Austria. Um, yeah, so it's a pretty unique microclimate, which was abused, I would say, for the longest time from industrial farming and then also from industrial winemaking. It was always the industrial bulk wine area because it's flat and you could work already really early and easy with machine. You have sand and loam and quite warm summers and long vegetation. So back then it was normal to have 30 tons on a hectare. I, I know you don't know what that means, sorry, but... Uh, it's a lot. It's like uh, nowadays we have, I don't know, like eight in a maximum or nine, you know, and so three times a month, like a lot of grapes. You can't even imagine how much, you know, it's like, it was, yeah, it took, it was taking advantage of the area. So it never created its own identity, I think, for a long time. Thank you for that. Sure. Okay, well, if anyone has another question, please speak up or else we're going to um, wrap up the call. Thank you for your um, time. Any other questions? Okay, so thank you, Nicholas. Thanks for staying up late to chat with oh, us. Oh, it's still early. I still didn't have dinner yet. So oh, I, I okay, get, great. Uh, I get tacos today. I know it's not Tuesday, <laughs> but it's not, right? It's Monday, but whatever. No, no, no Tafelspitz? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I've done every day for lunch, right? When she's cooking, you know, then it's more tacos and stuff like that. You know, avocado salad. She brings a Californian bite in that home. You know? <laughs> it's the only thing she's really missing, she says, you know, the, the, the good Mexican food in Southern California. But that's, yeah. Thank you so much. Well, well, thank, of, you. thank you guys. It was nice to meet you. Oh, I, thank I, you. See you I see you next year at yeah. one point in, in Seattle. I will definitely stop by at one point. It's one of my favorite cool. places, so I will come. Cool. cool. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. This bye. Also, just a bye. Just a meeting point. Um, we're, we've recorded this, so I'm going to send everyone a link in case you want to reference the conversation, or if you joined a bit later and you want to see something that we discussed earlier. Thanks. Bye, yeah. everyone. Thank you, Jenny.